So this may be my only opportunity to use the gavel. I might take one of those home with me, see if it has any effect on my daughters. So we're back to um, the home stretch of the uh, open session, and we're going to begin with a report on the genome sequencing program. This was actually something that was requested by the council during the council-initiated discussion in February. And uh, it's going to be a, a team report. Uh, I think Adam, is Adam in the room? There's Adam. Okay. So uh, Adam's going to lead off uh, with his report on the GSP, and then Chris Wellington will uh, step in as well. So Yeah, thank you, Rudy. So good afternoon, everyone. And yes, I'm going to tag team this with, um, with Chris. Um, just a quick update on the genome sequencing program. So some orientation. I know Eric talked a little bit about this in his uh, director's report. The um, genome sequencing program has four major elements uh, together situated uh, uh, between biology of genomes and biology of disease on our current sort of strategic scheme. Uh, they consist of the following four components, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, whose aim is to discover as many causal Mendelian uh, variants as possible, and Chris will pick up on this in a few minutes. The Centers for Common Disease Genomics, or CCDGs. Uh, whose aims uh, are to develop a paradigm for any common disease for the comprehensive discovery uh, of, uh, of genes and other elements that affect risk of alleles, both risk-raising and protective, coding and non-coding, and also they have an aim to improve methods, analytic methods and technology for all of that. There are also GSP analysis centers. Now, I'm not going to talk, most of the talk today is going to be about the first two components, but I have to, have to uh, uh, include something about the GSP analysis centers uh, who aim to develop and apply analysis methods to improve our ability to identify uh, variant associations, help develop a set of common controls based on the data produced by the, by the centers. Um, but uh, one of the things that I don't think uh, when they started I anticipated as much, uh, anticipated uh, that they would do, um, uh, that they are doing, is that they sort of force the issue on several um, important uh, areas, for example, the provision harmonization and analysis of data across the consortia, and to show what can be done early and reflect that back to the entire consortium. I should say the analysis centers are pretty diverse, what they do. Their, their, um, their analyses including, for example, uh, methods development to use population admixture information in analyses, and also uh, the use of functional data to help boost power to recognize non-coding variants. There is also uh, the coordinating center, um, which uh, tracks progress, um, helps with data storage for the consortium. Um, helps uh, lead and rationalize consortium policy development, so data access and publications, for example. They spearhead the common controls effort. Um, uh, they also help with logistics, and uh, uh, under that, et cetera, is a laundry list, as long as my arm, of things that they help with. The structure is fairly typical for this kind of um, consortium. Uh, it is a little bit baroque, but it's flexible and responsive to where the, the consortium wants to go. Um, it's fairly typical. Again, uh, there are. There are uh, disease working groups. Some of the some of the groups I'm going to point out because I'm going to talk about them later today. These are the disease, disease working groups for the CCDGs. Um, there's a, a data pipeline, data pipeline analysis and standardization, data flow working group, um, methods working group. Um, and here over in CMG, a number of working groups that maybe Chris will talk about. Um, there is, uh, we're, we are fortunate to have um, uh, a number of sources of co-funding. Um, much of that is from NHLBI. Um, and there's a lot of collaboration with the Transomics for Precision Medicine effort, uh, or TopMed, some from NIA, some from NIMH, and some from uh, NEI. There's also a lot of what I call indirect co-funding from several sources. That's when there's somebody, another entity is, is basically also interested in funding sequencing from the same phenotypes and sometimes from the same exact same cohorts. 
and it's great to be able to have to be able to mix the data when we can to, to do cross analysis when we can. And uh, just before I continue, I want to say uh, um, that both the CMGs and the CCDGs work would be impossible without extensively characterized samples. At, you know, for the CMG at the patient and family level, and at the CCTG at the, at the large cohort level, uh, funded and worked on by many completely outside of the program. So program timeline, um, the, the current iteration of the program was uh, started in 2016. Um, it ends at the end of 2019, roughly. You can see where we are here in May. Um, most of what we're going to talk about today um, for the Centers for for the Common Disease Genomics, GSP Analysis Centers, and the GSP Coordinating Center. Really, these were, these either changed their mission or were completely new two years ago, so most of what I'm going to talk about later is about progress in the last two years. The Centers for Mendelian Genomics, this is, a, this is their second round with roughly the same mission, so that'll cover six years. So I'll uh, leave it here for Chris. Thank you, Adam. So I'll give a brief update on progress from the CMGs. So as Adam just said, we are currently in the second iteration of the program. And the first phase was funded in late 2011 with three centers, one at Baylor Hopkins, one at University of Washington, and one at Yale. All three of those successfully recompeted for our phase two, and we also were able to add a fourth at the Broad. And also, as Adam mentioned, the coordinating center has been instrumental in the second phase since they came online. So back in 2011, the sort of framework for launching the CMGs, the overall purpose was really to see if it was feasible to um, do Mendelian gene discovery at large scale. And if so, to see if we could use that as a lens for insight into gene function and disease architecture. So the specific goals of the program were first to discover genes underlying Mendelian phenotypes, as many as possible, to develop strategies and tools for effective discovery, and then to disseminate and collaborate the findings of the project. So I'm just going to briefly walk through progress on each one of those. So again, when we launched this project, we weren't sure um, how this would work. So one of the important things is to define success, and we actually defined two different tiers of discovery. So the higher confidence tier one discoveries are where there are multiple lines of evidence, either multiple families, or one family plus model organism data or functional data. And then tier two is where there was only, discovery was only in a single family. So starting in the first phase of the project, um, things were slow for the first year, but by the end, there were over a thousand discoveries, which made us confident in renewing the program. When we, since the renewal, the uh, discovery has continued apace, and yes, we see that discontinuity. That's actually an interesting topic on its own. Um, those were a couple fairly large collections of samples with similar phenotypes that ended up resolving to a large number of underlying Mendelian causes. So, interesting in its own right. You'll also notice that there are about a thousand Tier 2 discoveries at present, and obviously we'd like to be able to move these to Tier 1. Um, these are rare diseases, more samples are hard to come by, so model organisms are a good approach for that in some cases. The number of discoveries. A discovery could be a association between a gene and a phenotype. Um, if there are multiple genes underlying similar phenotypes, that could count as multiple ones. So this is not count of unique genes or count of unique phenotypes. It's a combination of the two. Um, so model organisms are one approach. We don't directly fund the CMGs for that. So actually about a year and a half ago, they started a collaboration with COMP, Knockout Mouse Project which aims to make a comprehensive public resource of mice with a null mutation in every gene. So the CMGs share candidate variants with COMP. COMP is able to prioritize some of the mouse orthologs, um, and it ends up being a nice example of collaboration between two of our resources. At the same time, it's not that each of these discoveries is a simple gene that can be knocked out and recreated in the mouse, super straightforward manner. So just a brief example of something that's a little more complicated. Um, this was an example of biallelic inheritance of SMAD6 and craniosynostosis from the Yale Center. And here they found a loss of function in 
MAD6 strongly associated with the phenotype, but the penetrance was only about 60 percent, which would exclude it in a, a number of analysis pipelines from Mendelian discovery. But instead, in looking at some of the GWAS data that was collected previously, they saw a risk allele near BMP2, and when looking at the combination of the two, they got full penetrance in subjects who had the null mutations in SMAD6 and the risk phenotype, risk allele you know, near BMP2. So again, just an example of some of the slightly more nuanced um, discoveries that also come out of the CMG. So the second major goal is developing strategies and tools. So here, um, just a couple of very high level things. One, sort of strategic point is the value of high quality whole exome sequence for Mendelian discovery. Obviously, this is still less expensive than whole genome. At some point it won't be, but for now the CMGs have found this very useful. Another is um, that they have a number of strategies for doing analysis depending on sample availability and really recognizing that you can still do discovery um, even with a single case. Obviously, you'd rather have trios maybe or a larger number of cases. The CMGs have approaches for all those. A number of tools have come out of the CMG. Um, a couple high-level ones are listed there. And a particular note, three of the Matchmaker Exchange nodes, Matchbox, MyGene2, and GeneMatra, are all directly associated with CMGs. So finally, dissemination, collaboration. Obviously, everything I just talked about is freely available. Um, the CMGs also um, share pre-publication basis, um, the phenotypes that they're going to be working on. So others with samples can see that. Um, the candidate variants that are ident identified, again, help others in the field. They offer some courses on analysis, embedded training opportunities. They've done some valuable um, patient-facing collaborations, engaging either support groups or with social media. And they're members of the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. So now, just very briefly, you've seen where we are. Uh, what are we looking? forward to in the rest of the program. Constant question that always comes up is how much remains to be done. So I want to use two different lines here to suggest that we are nowhere near complete. The first is comp, which I mentioned earlier. And with the careful phenotyping pipelines comp has, they actually see one, usually more than one, phenotype in about 80% of their knockouts. That includes embryonic and early lethal as phenotypes. And it, at the present, about 20% of human genes have been implicated in phenotypes, Mendelian phenotypes. So you can argue around the edges of those numbers, but clearly there's a large gap there. And early, earlier we mentioned the um, rate of discoveries is continuing consistently. So we also would say on that basis, it seems that there's still much to be done. So, it's not surprising, probably, to hear the future plans and what we heard at the, in the external scientific panel at the in-person meeting of the genome sequencing program. We're really first and foremost to continue uh, what the CMGs are doing well, this effective, efficient discovery of variants underlying Mendelian disease. We're also looking at a couple other things, such as understanding and improving the solve rates. So at present, about half of the phenotypes that come in are solved, a little tricky to define that. Um, and so we're looking at adding whole genome sequence data, RNA-seq, try to understand the value proposition there. There have been some success cases with both of those, but we don't have enough data to know if it's actually an efficient use of resources. Also looking at what we can do by aggregating similar phenotypes across the CMG. And finally, we want to keep um, an eye toward the bigger picture uh, when we launch the program of using this as a lens to better understand human variation. Uh, for instance, you can imagine the impact of de novo. There are many trios sequenced under the CMGs, and some interesting potential there. And I mentioned an interaction between a rare and a common variant earlier. Well, there are also some that, um, some cases where we have Mendelian phenotypes that look a lot like common diseases, and looking at the contribution of Mendelian to that. So on that note, I'll turn it back over to Adam.
So back to the Centers for Common Disease Genomics. So you saw that for Mendelian disease caused by rare variants of very strong effects, there are now very many examples of finding the responsible variants. Um, the success rate at the CMGs is approaching 50 percent. Uh, and much of the time, I would say we know what we're doing. But for common disease, I'm much less sure. I think a lot of the time we still don't know what we're doing. And I'll return to this point at the end of the presentation. But first, I'm going to go through some basic progress. Just some numbers. Um, we are at about 58,000 genomes and 43,000 exomes, headed towards, by the end of the program, about 100,000. Sorry about that. Headed at the end of the program to about 100,000 whole genomes and about 125,000 or more whole exomes. This is a little bit higher than what uh, Eric showed in his slides, and that's because these, these numbers are actually capacity that is spoken for and capac plus capacity that's not yet spoken for. Um, other consortium progress, uh, we already had the first data freeze of 22,000 samples. That was last year. Freeze 2 uh, starts in June uh, with all of the whole genomes. Um, um, something I should say about, in case, you, in case you're not familiar with the jargon, a data freeze is just a convenient way to, to have a common data set to analyze across the consortium. These were all, um, these were all processed through the coordinated or through the synchronized, um, um, the harmonized uh, data processing pipeline that was developed in the first year. Uh, just a brief uh, look at Ancestry. These are for samples received. This is the best, the, the, this is what I could, could get right now. This is uh, samples received. It's a little bit of a proxy for sample sequence, but it's where we're headed. And the main point here is um, that even, uh, even including the, 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 the green wedge samples that, that we don't know the Ancestry for, um, that just over half the samples are of a non-European uh, Ancestry. Um, this is just breaking out uh, some of the numbers in detail, and I'm not, I'm not asking you to look at everything, uh, not at all the numbers, but I just want to make a couple of points. First of all, the sequencing is, is spread out over eight, you'll actually see ten different columns, but really there are, there are eight different disease phenotypes here um, that are really part of the consortium, um, and that means that it, it takes a while, it's taking a while to build up sufficient numbers um, to be able to do analyses, and these analyses are just, are just starting. The other point that I want to make is that, uh, and I'll show a simplified version of this in a second, is that there are, um, there are three umbrella disease working groups, the immune-mediated, cardiovascular, and neuropsychiatric working group. Um, with immune-mediated, um, thinking about and coordinating work on type 1 diabetes, asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, the cardiovascular working group on early onset coronary artery disease, early onset AFib, and hemorrhagic stroke, and the neuropsychiatric working group on epilepsy and autism. I just want to show a couple of vignettes, one from each of these working groups that were presented at the, at the recent meeting. Um, so the immune-mediated working group presented work on type 1 diabetes. This was from about 3,000 samples from the Diabetes Genetics Consortium, which includes cases and controls of African, Hispanic, and Asian ancestry subjects. Um, there are 58 previously known GWAS loci in European ancestry samples. Um, this study replicated some of those loci and found four new, new alleles at known loci. They also found that at several known loci, associated variants in Caucasian ancestry po populations are not observed in African ancestry populations with novel associations a little bit of a distance away from those. This is evidence for population differences. Uh, in the cardiovascular working group uh, on uh, some results on early onset um, uh, MI, looking at cases from the CCDG uh, effort and controls from the top med effort. Um, they did a whole genome sequencing to ascertain polygenic risk scores for early uh, MI, and about 17 percent of cases had high polygenic risk, but not other distinguishing factors. So, for example, not, they didn't have evident bad lipids or worse lipids than, than controls. Um, this is, they had equivalent risk to individuals with a rare, strong LDL receptor variant for familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, I like this for a couple of reasons. First, it shows an application of the CCDG data that I certainly didn't anticipate at the outset of uh, what I thought was a discovery effort. This is a little bit closer to the clinic, and I think that's, that's cool. 
Um, second, this highlights a point about the importance of genomic architecture. There's a strong monogenic component here and also polygenic component of what we call the same disease. The neuropsychiatric working group, um, looking at about 12,000 quads um, from the Simons Foundation samples, um, together with some existing data, found likely uh, damaging exonic alleles uh, in 124 previously known uh, plus nine novel genes. These implicate synaptic activity and from the modification pathways, and they showed uh, evidence for a role of non-coding variants and estimates of their contribution. So there are other kinds of analyses going on uh, at the, in the CCDGs and together with the analysis centers. Um, we've seen, you know, a few that are about the, the sort of the expected kinds of variant discovery studies for each disease. Uh, but they also include analyses that can be done across data sets, for example, on basic genome biology like structural variant discovery and ancestry LD studies, um, um, work on study design, um, improvements, methods development, um, methods comparisons, and development of secondary resources. Um, there are a lot of other activities going on, including um, as I told you, the standardized data processing pipelines across the CCDGs have been developed already, and that paper has just been submitted, I understand. That's from the analysis and data flow working groups. Um, there is an effort to try to aggregate the data between NHLBI and TopMed. Um, if we can do that, that will afford analysis of about 150,000 whole genomes. Um, there's joint variant calling plan, so both within, so across all the CCDG samples, and also if we can get the aggregation to go, um, go forward together with top med, and that's, again, work from analysis and data flow working groups. Um, there's some thought of uh, putting together an imputation server based on the data, um, and also there's been coordination on data annotation and markup uh, within both the Centers for Common Disease Genomics and together with top med. Um, and there have been uh, two joint uh, CCDG top med analysis meetings already and another one planned for this winter. So I want to return just to uh, something I said at the beginning here. And that is, for Mendelian, we know what we're doing. Not that there's not a lot, a lot more to do. And of course, as Chris showed, some, some examples of very interesting biology that the Mendelian centers are getting into. Um, and we have a lot of examples, but for common disease, we don't. Uh, I still think we're near, quite near the beginning. So you might know the CCDGs have been working on uh, what they call a goals, strategy, and plan document. Um, the goals were really stated in the introduction and the, and the, the other slide. Another slide. The strategy, depart, uh, strategy part of that document has now gotten quite exhaustive. I think, I think people are just trying to cover every aspect of it, but I think it can be summarized. I think it can be easily summarized by looking at it as a statement of the state of the art here. And uh, some of those are reflected on the next slide, which is taken directly from the discussion about um, strategy at the meeting. And I just want to make a few points. So rare variant, if you, if you look at the block, it's this one, right? This one. If you just look at this block, right, you can, see, you can see that rare variant studies looking at coding regions is working. It's beginning to work, and it looks like it has room to grow, all right? Um, Although, note the large, you, if you, you know, think about it, you look at the large number of cases that are needed to, to find just a few rare variants in coding regions, right? And maybe that's not unexpected. But in contrast, there's still very few. In fact, some people have asserted that there aren't any examples of well-validated non-coding variants, non-coding variants being identified in rare variant association studies. Uh, so how can we address th those challenges? There's, probably a number of ways, um, you know, in addition to clever study design and better analysis, um, it would be, uh, you know, it would be great to have, um, you know, uh, so, sorry, so clever study design and better analysis methods may help 
um, especially for some diseases or maybe some components of some diseases. I think that's important to consider. But otherwise, uh, we probably need much more functional information, much better functional annotation of the genome um, to help with that. So based on all the discussions, the CCDG plans going forward are to maintain work on the current range of diseases, um, to continue exploration of different approaches, so exomes to find coding variants in case control studies, um, whole genomes and families where there's a strong, maybe even de novo component of the architecture, um, and still pursue genomes in case control studies uh, to begin to look at non-coding and sort of to stimulate the field. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of improved design, um, better analysis methods, better technologies. The external scientific panel recommendations were that uh, the CCDG should not add a new project at this time, even though the one under consideration would add a new design, um, just for the sake of concentrating power on the existing studies. Um, where there's environmental data, uh, there is some to add that analysis. Um, uh, to, um, to actually do some more systematic evaluation of methods, for instance, for example, SV calling or developing polygenic risk scores, um, to um, have the cross-consortium collaborations add um, um, collaborations on polygenic risk scores, um, this is already going on, uh, and phenotype harmonization. Um, and finally, um, they recommended that we should increase outside collaborations beyond the current scope to include other organizations and other, other consortia. There are um, way too many people to acknowledge. I can't, I can't, uh, can't put them all even on uh, two slides, but uh, there are the Centers for Mendelian Genomics, the Centers for Common Disease Genomics, um, the three analysis centers. Um, uh, I want to especially thank our coordinating center and team sequence and also members of our external scientific panel. With that, I'll end and open it up for questions for either me or for Chris. Or maybe I'll ask, maybe I'll ask Jonathan to start off since he's one of our ESP members. Right. So, I mean, I, I, think, I think Adam and, and Chris covered it, covered it pretty well. I think, I think one of the things that the, the external uh, panel uh, is really looking forward to is it's it's we're we're about halfway through so the data is just getting there, for per, particularly for the CCDGs, and so a, a lot of the analysis and the results of that aren't aren't quite aren't quite there because the data is just getting there because the the freeze two is just coming right I mean that's that's yeah not, freeze two is next month yeah it's next month so. Uh, and there'll be a lot more that they can they can do with that, and particularly with like the analysis centers. They're going to be they're gearing up with ideas and, and developing methods, but they'll be you know able to apply that. So I think in in general you've seen the recommendations, and I I think that uh, you know we, we certainly feel reasonably good about how things are going. So the the when you when you count the significant SNPs. That's based, I assume, on p-values, von Ferroni corrected p-values. What, what are the, uh, 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 rel uh, the effect sizes? You yeah, so that was on the slide, and I, I could go back to it. And again, I, it's not my, my slide, so I can only comment so much on the details, but I'll go back. Um, so inflammatory bowel disease, these are moderate effect sizes, so threefold, same for cardiovascular disease, maybe larger effect for schizophrenia, and then huge for autism. Yeah, I, so I, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't read too much into the details of the slide. Um, right. The reason I'm asking is because if you have, in some of these, I assume that you ha you already have a huge sample size, and you only had a few go over the significance threshold, which technically could be lowered if you wanted. Uh, by adding more and more samples, you you might get something significant, but now the the effect size 
must be very, very small. And the yes. question is, does it yes. even matter at this point? Yeah, so that's, that's a whole question that was anticipated, maybe not fully anticipated at the beginning of the program. And, um, you know, that was one of the reasons to, to one of the several reasons to, to, um, to try with a select number of diseases um, to push as far as we could push. Um, we were, we were told by one council member at the time, you know, you'll probably have to go farther into the realm of diminishing returns um, than you wanted to in order to understand really where you were, but, you know, where you are. Um, and we did, we did have maybe the naive idea at the outset that, that we could bring enough sequencing power to this to actually be comprehensive about a few diseases. But things have gotten, the picture of genomic architecture disease, I think, has gotten quite a bit more complicated since then. Um, but this is a very important question, is what, what is the point of diminishing returns? When do you know you've hit it? And what does that really mean? Yeah, Jonathan. Maybe I could, I could address that a little bit. Um, the, I mean, there's a difference between the effect size of the individual variant, which could be, you know, it could be extremely rare, but that variant may have a, an extremely large effect. The question is population attributable risk. How much does it mean to the population as a whole? And that's where you start getting into how far down, you know, do you want to go in terms of diminishing returns at the population level? I mean, certainly for the individual or the family that has that rare variant, it's very, 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 very important. And it might open up new biology. You don't know. But, you know, you, that's, that's a balance that, that I think everybody is, is struggling with a little bit. Yeah, Jay. Well, I will say, um, you know, my bias would be that, you know, that we may already be at that point. Uh, but, but I, you know, I think it also depends on dividing it up into this dichotomy of whether we're doing this to explain disease risk through specific findings or whether we're doing it to, to get to leads, you know, for, for, for biology. Right. Um, if we're doing it for risk, I, I think that, I mean, one of the most, and you highlighted a bit here, but I, I thought the study from uh, Sack Catharacian, you know, I think it's still on bioarchive, I and mean, I think that's one of the most exciting developments of the last couple of years. Um, and I, 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 I think we should be paying a lot more attention to it. Maybe you guys already are, but I feel like it should be kind of um, permeating through all of the genomic medicine aspects of this institute as quickly as possible, what the implications of that are, right? Because all of, all of the genomic medicine folks tend to really be focused on the rare variant specific genes. And if this really is that we can predict, you know, um, an equivalent risk for a much larger fraction, that has pretty big implications. Yeah, so the, essentially the same thing was said by our ESP during the meeting in April. I guess another comment is that if, now that following up on Jay's uh, comment, if, you're, if what you're interested in is in leads, then Bonferroni corrected at the, what is it, whatever it is, 0 0.05 or 0 0.01 level is incredibly conservative. And you could definitely make that instead to a FDR of 0 0.05, and, and then your sample sizes come way, way, way down. If what you want are leads, just comment. Do millions and millions of dollars. So the, the, these are discussions that happen almost weekly, I, I'm sure, within, certainly when, when we're having the, the joint meetings, those discussions come up as to where should we go with it. And, you know, if you loosen things up and you do more and the, the, the polygenic risk score kinds of things, can you, you know, where can you go? So these are, these are ongoing, ongoing discussions and debate. So it's a, it's a good point. This is coming at it as a bit, a bit of an affectionado and not, you know, knowing the details of this area super well, but just looking at it from the outside, it seems like focusing resources on getting risk, polygenic risk scores for non-white populations would be a super use of money in the near term, if that's at all a, a possibility with the cohorts that are available. Yeah, so Jay, we've just started to think to think about this again since since April, since since we saw that presented, and um, and some of that has to do with 
with how, right, how much of a shift it requires in, in analysis and uh, also in data production. And we just haven't thought through that yet. So I don't know if you've done this calculation, but could you figure out in terms of identifying new leads or new targets cost per target that you identify in terms of either the CMG or with the common variants? And if you did use the CMGs for getting at some of the common diseases, are those phenotypes represented in the CMGs? So the easy one first, I guess. For the CMGs, it's about 30 exomes that we sequence for each thing that gets counted as a discovery. I already said there's a little nuance to what a discovery is. There. Um, so there it's relatively low. And whether it's representative on the phenotypes, that's something that we tend to find out at the end. Right, and, and I, I, my inclination is to resist doing that too soon for the complex disease because right now the cost per is going to be astronomical. I'll, I'll right, well, I won't say anything. <clears throat> is autism a Mendelian disorder that's very heterogeneous or a complex disorder? Can I, can I just answer yes? <laughs> well, the question goes to what do we learn in going forward and selecting other disorders to study? Because yeah. there could have been guesses made about, right. I'm sure there were about autism. Yeah, especially about, about that component of autism. And, um, and yes, in hindsight, it does seem sometimes that there could have been could have been guesses, but I think at the outset, maybe maybe not so much. Although I agree with you that it's it's clear that there's sort of a, you know, there's a overlap in the Mendelian mission and the CCDG mission, um, maybe maybe with that kind of study. Was autism purely the CC uh, genome sequencing, or was it the Mendelian? It's purely CCDG, and there's it there's a whole there's a Part of it is a, is a whole genomes and families and quads design, and part of it is a, is a cohort design done, done at two different centers. Okay. Chris, Adam, thank you very much. Thanks. Let's move along.